program from Imagine, Erie, Pennsylvania. If you take a close look at the poverty figures, the most ironic and I think tragic conclusion that you reach is that we were winning the war on poverty in this country until shortly after Lyndon Johnson declared war on it. From the mighty mountains of New York, let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Labor unions have used their power over the years to support policies and programs here in Washington uh, that have the effect of excluding blacks. Some 55% of all black children in America are now born out of wedlock. Free at last! Free at last! Thanks for the money! Free at last! 1963, a time of incredible optimism for black people. The civil rights movement was about to achieve its greatest triumphs. A great war on poverty had been declared. But something went wrong. They say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. This might be that road. It's covered thick with good intentions. In the mid-1960s and throughout the 70s and early 80s, federal and state governments poured immense energy and well over a trillion dollars into the task of relieving poverty and promoting equality. The result, a complete failure. For many blacks at the lower end of the economic spectrum, the future looks more hopeless today than it did 20 years ago. More black teenagers and young adults are unemployed. More black families depend on welfare. Fewer black children are getting a decent education. In some inner cities, more than 70% of black babies are born out of wedlock. More black youngsters commit crimes. More black people are victims of crimes. My name is Dr. Walter Williams, and I'm an economist. I have spent much of my life studying the causes of poverty. I broke out of the North Philadelphia ghetto nearly 30 years ago, and so did most of my friends. But today, fewer young blacks are escaping places like this. I want to spend the next 30 minutes exploring the reasons why. For believe it or not, to a considerable extent, the government is the culprit. It is the government with its hundreds of billions of dollars. It is the government with its thousands of programs. It is the government with its endless good intentions. Freedom, 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 freedom. Government anti-poverty programs have often ended up locking people into poverty. To see how, let's begin where everybody begins, in school. This is the first place I ever did that, Benjamin Franklin High School in North Philly. Franklin was mostly black when I was a student here in 1954. It has always had its problems financially and academically. But I got a solid education here, and so did my classmates. Most of my classmates read at or above grade level. They came to school, they did their homework, and they behaved. But as in most schools all over America, Things at Franklin got worse in the 60s and 70s. Test scores plummeted. Many Franklin students do work far below high school level. More students get diplomas, but those diplomas are worth less. And discipline got so bad that at Franklin, as in most nearby schools, security guards patrol the hallways. In the early 1960s, the federal government was putting less than a billion dollars a year into elementary and secondary education. Since 1964, federal spending on elementary secondary schools has gone up more than 900 percent. And during that very period, education has gone downhill by every conceivable objective measurement of real academic performance. The 1960s were a time of great hope for public education. Not only was federal money coming in, most black people believed that integration and the civil rights movement would put black parents in greater control of the children's education. It didn't work out that way. Twenty years ago, more than half of every dollar spent on education went to classroom teachers. 
But today, the fastest growth area in education is administrators, researchers, consultants, people who often don't even set foot in a classroom, and who are now spending less than 40 cents out of every dollar on classroom teachers. There's a parasitic structure that has come into being that has nothing to do with the interaction between teacher and child in the classroom. Can we really blame government for the nationwide decline in education? Can't we blame the Vietnam War, or the turmoil of the 60s, or lingering discrimination? Unfortunately not. While public schools are falling apart, non-public schools are maintaining their standards. Schools like this one, Ivy Leaf of Philadelphia, just a few miles from Benjamin Franklin. Ivy Leaf spends far less in educating their children, yet 80% of their children score higher than the national norm on standardized reading and math tests. When my daughter was in the public schools, my husband and I felt that she was not being challenged enough. So we took her out and put her in Ivy Leaf, and we're very happy, and she's very happy, because not only is she making good grades, she also has self-confidence, and she's showing some leadership qualities. Within the last two years, the National Center for Neighborhood Enterprise has been working on uh, a study trying to identify where the independent schools, especially those schools that catered primarily to minority students. We found a great number that were stable, uh, successful in producing achieving students. Independent schools are doing a much better job than public schools on the average. Public schools are bad for black people today for the same reasons they were bad 30 years ago under segregation. Black parents did not control the public schools then, and black parents do not control the public schools today. Some people have been fighting to give parents that control. A few years ago here in Washington, D.C., proponents of the tuition tax credit bill worked hard to push forth this initiative, which would simply allow, in the city, poor parents to have freedom of choice for their kids to attend the school of their choice, whether it's a public or non-public school. They simply wanted to make sure that their kids got a quality education. Now, this tuition tax credit scheme is nothing more than a device through which the individual parent would receive a tax credit uh, on their income tax by taking that money allowed by the public education system. Now, it was soundly defeated here in Washington, D.C., simply because the education establishment vehemently opposed it because they did not want the inner city parents to have freedom of choice. Many of the politicians who got involved in this fight against tuition tax credits actually have their kids in non-public schools, in exclusive private schools, if you will. And it's an absolute tragedy. Tuition tax credits wouldn't provide a utopia, but they would give poor parents the power to choose a school like Ivy Leaf, rather than see their children condemned to a third-rate public school. As long as they have the best for their kids, they simply don't care about the others. So what happens to kids who leave third-rate public schools for the job market? 